Fasten your seatbelt and get ready for the red eye. Each week, we'll be immersing you in a world of adventure, from thrilling dramas to side-splitting humor and life-altering moments. Welcome aboard the Red Eye. When you work in commercial aviation, it's not unusual for you to carry different kinds of passengers from time to time. If you're lucky, that will be a big furry assistance dog for you to pet and fuss over all flight. On a rare occasion, you might end up with a stretcher installed over a few rows of seats and a medical team repatriating a patient. Or, in the case of this story, you might have a passenger who really doesn't want to be on board. Someone who, against their will, is being deported. Now, while that might sound dramatic, people are deported every single day, and sometimes for things as minor as simply not having the right documentation to enter the country they've just landed in. In these cases, they are deported before they've even officially arrived. They will be escorted by an immigration official to the aircraft door, their passport will be handed over to the manager on board, and they will, usually quietly, take their seat. When the plane arrives at its destination, the manager will give them back their passport and off they will get, back where they started. Sometimes, though, it's not quite so civilised. As in the case of this story, sometimes the deportees will be convicted criminals who have served their prison sentence and are being returned to their home country to be released. In such cases, where they pose a threat to safety or might resist being sent home, it is usual for them to be escorted by security guards. After all, we crew are trained in a lot of things, but there are some things that we just didn't sign up for. London to Moscow, pre-flight briefing, 0600 hours. Alison was tired. A month of there and backs, early check-ins and short layovers was catching up on her. The manager, Jane, was talking, but she kept drifting off, imagining herself in her big hotel bed in Moscow, catching up on about 20 hours of sleep on her 24-hour layover. The door knocked and the lady from the check-in desk stepped in, handing a piece of paper to Jane, just as she finished asking the last of the crew their safety questions. Thank you, Jane said, her eyes squinting as she scanned it. The lady pulled the door quietly behind her as she left the room. Right, I'll just pass you over to Alison, your purser in economy today, she said, pulling the reading glasses down from where they had been on the top of her head. Hearing her name, Alison fixed a smile on her face and narrated the script that she had said so many times she didn't need to read it. Be nice to passengers, monitor drinkers, deliver the service professionally, use your skills and knowledge to deal with the problems, have a nice flight. Oh, and drink lots of water. Her crew nodded and smiled back. She doubted they'd listened to a word. They looked as tired and disinterested as her. Thank you, Alison, said Jane when she had finished. The memo was laid in front of her now, and her hand was palmed down on top of it. Right, she said, drawing in a deep breath. So, one last thing, folks. If I can just have your attention. Something about her tone made everyone sit up straight. The memo they just gave me, she tapped the paper, was to tell us that we have an escorted prisoner who is being deported on board our flight today. She paused and looked around the room. Don't look so worried, she said with a motherly smile. She was at least a decade older than anyone else in the room, and Alison suspected there was nothing that she hadn't seen before. Has anyone had an escorted deportee on board before? She asked, looking around the table. No one said yes. Right, she said. Well, firstly, there is nothing to worry about, so you can all stop looking so concerned, she laughed. The prisoner and escorts will board the aircraft first. Those of you on the left-hand side man your doors as usual, but try to stay out of the way if you can. Once they're settled, we will get the other passengers on. She glanced down at the paper. It looks like there will be four escorts, plus one prisoner. She turned and looked at Alison now. The last three rows at the back will be blocked out for them. Alison nodded. She had a strange, nervous feeling in her stomach. Why was that? Now, crew, Jane continued, just so we are clear... We serve the prisoner exactly as we would serve any customer, with the exception of alcohol. We don't know what they've done, and it's not for us to judge, so just be courteous as you would to anybody else, she smiled. Now, she said, glancing up at the clock, 
We've run over, so we'd better get going. Gate 15. Ten chairs scraped backwards on the hard floor as the crew left the room and made their way out to the aircraft. I feel a bit nervous, Alison admitted as her and Jane left the room together. Oh, don't be. It'll be fine, Jane said with a smile. I've had lots. We used to carry them all the time. The escorts will take care of everything, and it's always handy to have a few big strong men on board if we have any other problems, she grinned. It's how I met my husband, she said with a wink. Alison gawped. He was a prisoner, she asked. No, Jane laughed, a guard. Many years ago on a Jamaica. Alison hung up the receiver, having made her welcome announcement. The prisoner had looked so harmless, not much bigger than she was, handcuffed and flanked by four huge guards. His face was sallow, deep wrinkles that told of a hard life. She couldn't help but wonder what he had done. He had slipped into a middle seat between two of them without a word, and the rest of the passengers had been called. Outside, the rain was lashing down. Typical London weather for April. She leaned over and looked out of her window down onto the ramp, watching the baggage handlers lifting the bags from the trucks and loading them onto the conveyor belts that took them up into the hold. The sound took a moment to register before she realised it was in the cabin. Could have been an animal, wild, almost roaring. Before she'd even turned around, there then came shouting. Spit it out! Spit it out! In the back row, she could see that all four guards were up and leaning over the prisoner, their arms grappling with him. It seemed that all of them were shouting. The noise was deafening. In the aisle, a few rows up, a mother cupped her young daughter's ears with her hands and turned her around. Some passengers stopped shocked in the aisles at what was going on in front of them, and some started shouting, telling the guards to stop, looking like they might interfere themselves. It was terrifying seeing five grown men fight with each other, punches being thrown, wild arms grabbing at faces. Blood was coming from somewhere. Alison froze. It went against her nature not to respond to something happening on board, but she knew she should just stay here, safe by the door. She picked up the handset and called the one doors. Jane L1, Alison spoke quietly. Jane, I've got a bit of a sitch coming, said Jane putting the phone down before she'd finished her sentence. In the galley, Alison handed the guard a tube of wet wipes. He dabbed pointlessly at the bloodstains on his white shirt. Thanks anyway, he said. I think this one's for the bin. His forehead was glistening with beads of sweat. Alison could only imagine the adrenaline that must have come into play as they had tried to open his mouth and remove the razor blade that he had been hiding in there. Where did he get it from? Jane asked. The guard shrugged. They have their ways, he sighed. Not the first time I've seen it. Alison was horrified. To her, it was unimaginable that someone would do that to themselves. Why? she asked. Again, he shrugged. He really doesn't want to go home. He thinks if he hurts himself, we'll have to get off and he'll go back to the detention centre. They do it all the time. But surely... He huffed a laugh. Yep, I know what you're going to say. Surely he'll have to go eventually, she nodded. He's not thinking that far ahead, he said, looking over his shoulder as another guard appeared behind him. He too had blood on his shirt and sweat on his hand. He's good to go, he said. He's still going, Jane asked, raising her eyebrows and looking at the blood on their shirts. The second guard nodded. He's okay. A deep cut, but nothing we need to get off for, if that's okay with you. Well, Julie frowned. If you don't think there'll be any more bother... It'll be no problem now, he said with reassuring certainty. The guard had been right. There had been no more trouble. As soon as the aircraft had taken off, it was like the prisoner had just accepted. There was nothing he could do about it anymore, and he gave in. Would you like some dinner? Alison hesitated, unsure how she should address the man who looked so helpless and, well, sad now. She had told her crew that she would serve him, as they had all seemed so scared to go anywhere near him. Sir? He didn't look at her. 
I have chicken or beef? Beef, he said, without turning around. His eyes were fixed on the blank screen in front of him. She could see blood dried around his mouth and wondered how he would manage to eat as she gave the tray to the guard nearest to her. Whatever he had done to have been imprisoned and deported, the thought of going home was clearly so terrifying to him that he had been prepared to really hurt himself to avoid it. At that moment, she'd felt sorry for him, until the guard had come to the galley for a coffee shortly after the meal service. Do you know what he did? she asked, making his drink. Aggravated rape, he said. Alison's blood ran cold. When she had asked the question, she hadn't expected him to answer it. She'd fully expected him to say that he couldn't tell her, and right now, she would actually have rather he hadn't. She shuddered as she gave him the coffee. Yep, nasty piece of work, he said, reading the horror that must have shown on her face. So, will he be monitored in Moscow? She asked, sure they had said earlier that he would be released. I doubt it, he said. He's done his time. You just let him go? She asked, shocked at what she was hearing. Yep, he said. We just have to get him to immigration and then he's their problem. I have heard that some of the more horrible ones get a special welcome home greeting, though. He grinned and balled his fists, punching out at the air in front of him. Alison gulped. The plane touched down in Moscow and they taxied to their stand. Alison disarmed the door as the seatbelt sign switched off, and she backed up close to the bulkhead behind her as the escort stood up. They'd taken off his handcuffs now and given him a rucksack that he'd put on his back. She watched him shuffle between the guards up the aisle to the disembarkation door. Later, in the immigration hall, she saw him from afar hand his passport to the official on the desk, and that was the last that she saw of him. What happened to him after that, she could only imagine. On the bus ride in the hotel, she looked for him. Her eyes had been opened on that flight. Murderers and rapists weren't just in prisons locked away from the world. They sat on her plane and, for all she knew, walked among the same crowds as she did. She didn't sleep like she'd hoped to that morning for 20 hours of a 24-hour layover. No, she didn't sleep a wink. The Red Eye Podcast is produced and narrated by me, Ali Murphy. These stories are based on true events, but certain details, characters, and timelines have been altered to protect the innocent. Visit our website, theredeyepod.com, to subscribe to our newsletter and to find out details on how you can contribute your story for us to turn into an episode. If you enjoyed listening to our stories, please like, subscribe, and review. Thank you.